Our next man is um, John Gibbons. Um, he's an Irish environmental campaigner and the founder of the climate change website, climatechange.ie. For two years, he contributed a weekly column to the Irish Times, analysing aspects of climate change and sustainability. The newspaper dropped the column in February 2010, although it continued to publish articles by John Gibbons. His work has also appeared in the Sunday Tribune. Critical of global media coverage of climate change, John argues that there is a similar trend in Ireland and has accused Irish newspapers and RTE of giving too much coverage to anti-science climate change uh, deniers and failing to convey the gravity of the threat making readers and viewers apathetic. John writes a blog called Think or Swim about climate change, sustainability, energy and related social issues and his Twitter account, Think or Swim, has nearly 3,000 followers. John's talk today is entitled Politics, Media and Communication. Now, first of all, uh, good morning, uh, everybody, and thank you very much for the uh, invitation to speak here today. Uh, so um, I just want to start really with, uh, well, the first thing I'll, I'll do is nobody likes to follow John Sweeney. Uh, and I, I mean that, John, in the nicest possible way, because he's, he's Ireland's guru on climate change, so I think we're very privileged to have him here. But he's also really botched up a, lo a large part of the scientific part of my presentation, but I'm going to have to just fumble through uh, nonetheless. So I'm saying that simply to advise you that there will be a certain amount of overlap, but I'll take that as, a, as <coughs> inevitable. Anyway, I want to start with this headline from the Washington Post. Um, it's from a couple of weeks back. I just thought it was an extraordinary uh, statement. What we're doing to the Earth has no parallel in 66 million years. I suppose I'm going to talk, obviously, about climate change, but I'm going to talk to you about climate change not so much as a phenomenon, but more as a symptom, and as a symptom of something that has gone really, really wrong in our relationship with the rest of the world. So I see climate change in those terms rather than say, you know, climate change is this big problem, which it is, which we've got to fix, which we do, but I also see it as a symptom of a much wider problem. And that's really what I want to talk to you mostly about today. So, now, I don't know if anybody's seen this before, or these images before, or if you know what's going on here. Uh, I'll give you, the first picture isn't very clear, the second one would be better, but I put up another one as well. Does anybody know what, what this woman is doing? Yeah, hand pollinating. Uh, this is in parts of China where the, the pollinator, um, shall we say, population has collapsed and essentially there are no insect pollinators left. There's been so, they've, been, they've essentially been, been poisoned into, into extinction. So we're left in a situation if you want your food, and I think 40%, uh, I believe, of the world's food at the moment is insect pollinated. So um, while at the same time we're, we're, we're giving our, our uh, insect population a very, very hard time because obviously it suits us to certain types of agriculture. Um, but this is, to me, a very stark reminder of what happens shall we say, unintended consequences. I'm pretty sure the people who, who wiped out the insect population probably thought they were destroying pests. And it probably didn't occur to them that some of these so-called pests are actually the pollinators that we all depend on. Because um, Roundup doesn't particularly, or other, other uh, chemicals, they don't particularly distinguish between one type of insect and another. So the science bit, which, as I say, John has already thoroughly ruined, but I shall plod on. Um, this is a, an old sign from the 19th century. Uh, it was an advertisement, as you can see, for they were selling co coal in a cart. And it turned out that they were right. So this is a, again, I'm going to keep the science bit as light as possible, but I, I always find this very instructive because we tend to talk an awful lot, and rightly so, we tend to talk a, a huge amount about what's happening in the atmosphere, atmospheric warming, understandably, and we, we, we all follow it. However, if you look at the slide here, and I get my, my little flicker, this is the bit that you're talking about. But where's all the energy going? There's where the energy is going. So we have essentially the build-up over time of a massive accumulation of energy into essentially a closed system. 
So this slide or this chart goes from 1950 to 2000. So you'll appreciate that you can continue it on. Now, the energy we're talking about here is so massive, it's, it's hard to describe. So scientists have helpfully translated it into, into a, a currency that they call Hiroshima's. So what I, one Hiroshima is the amount of energy that the Hiroshima explosion released. Not the, not the radiation, just the energy. So what they found is, and I'll, I'll just show you the second part of this, we're, since 1950, the, the, sorry, since 1970, the rate of energy building up in the Earth's system is the equivalent of exploding 2.5 Hiroshima's per second. Now, let's move that forward. That's the energy equivalent of 78 million Hiroshima's a year for the last 44 years. But since 2000, this is now running at the energy equivalent of 4 Hiroshima's per second. That's how much energy it takes to run global civilization. And because we're principally doing this with fossil fuels, the emissions and the, the byproducts of all this energy are, as we see, they're, they're in our system and they're altering our system. But sometimes, you know, when you hear kilojoules and petajoules and all the rest, they're very hard figures to imagine. This is easier to imagine. So the amount of energy sufficient if you concentrate it in a single spot to flatten a mid-sized city we release four of those a second. So even since I've started talking, just think of how much energy has been released in the world in a closed system. Now, I love this ad. Back in the 1960s, the wonderful thing about advertising is they told the truth because they hadn't got around yet to actually adjusting the advertising to, to push back from society. So this, uh, this uh, company here, uh, you'll recognize the logo, which was a, it was a precursor of ESSO called ENCO. And they brought out this wonderful ad called, uh, about every day they supply enough energy to melt 7 million tonnes of glacier. This was a, an advertising boast. They weren't suggesting that they would do that, but it just underpins how thoroughly the energy industry understood all those years ago just how powerful the energy that they were involved with. And this, remember, is one oil company 50 years ago boasting that it could melt 7 million tonnes of glaciers a day. So it's a lot of what we're talking about today is actually about scale. And I think so many human actions, we see this, it's really about scale. So they, oh yeah, they, they go on to talk about whatever number of tons it is a second and so on. Now, this is a short film. I hope we have sound. Just for those who say we don't know this. What would happen if we could change the course of the Gulf Stream or the other great ocean currents? Or warm up Hudson Bay with atomic furnaces? Extremely dangerous question. Because with our present knowledge, we have no idea what would happen. Even now, man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release of factories and automobiles every year of more than six billion tons of carbon dioxide, helps air absorb heat from the sun. And our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad. Well, it's been calculated a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice cap. And if this happened, an inland sea would fill a good portion of the Mississippi Valley. Tourists and glad bottom folk would be viewing the ground towers of Miami through 150 feet of tropical water. In foreign weather, we're not only dealing with forces of a far greater variety than even the atomic physicists encountered, but with life itself. And when I was looking that up, I also found another article from 1958. And this one is called, The Climate Really Is Getting Warmer. So I suppose I, I put these up here because these go back to the era when science wasn't a contact sport and climate science, what, science wasn't a contestable where essentially everybody with an opinion or a grudge could pile in with their tuppence worth. It was simply, here's the science, here are the facts, heat this up, it gets warmer, what does that mean? So unfortunately, in more recent times, as the, as the shall we say, the implications of the science have begun to strike 
not just on the public, but also on massive vested interests, and, and John referred to these earlier. But just to bear in mind, the world's biggest industry, the largest industry in the history of the world, is the global fossil-based energy industry. It is a multi-trillion dollar industry. It, is, it faces obliteration if governments and the public withdraw its license to actually exist. Once upon a time, slavery was one of the world's biggest industries. Society withdrew the license of countries and organizations to trade in other humans. We got to a point where even though there was economic benefits, the downside was considered to be so outrageous that we withdrew that license and that whole business evaporated. The fossil fuel industry finds itself in a very similar position at the moment. So they're fighting tooth and nail to convince you that this isn't really happening, or it's not so bad, or it's something else, or it's sunspots. But we'll, we'll, we'll truck on. Now, again, I'm keeping the science bit fairly, to a, hopefully to a minimum here, but I think what's important, what you're looking at here, is a 12,000-year uh, temperature record. And if we're wildly fortunate, and we end up with very low climate sensitivity, and there is no, nothing being published right now to suggest that's the case, we're looking at uh, temperatures by 2100, in that kind of range, but more likely the mid-range is here. And you really have to look at, the, at the, the time scale to try and imagine the kind of world that this might be. And the short answer is we can't, because humans have never evolved in a climate anything remotely like this, nor have our agricultural systems. So essentially everything here is terra incognita. We don't know, but we know enough to know that this type of climate has worked extraordinarily well for humans and for other animals. And there be dragons. So I mentioned in my earlier slide here about uh, the fact that things go up as well as down. And I just thought it might be useful, and sometimes it gets overlooked, to look at the, the other, the flip side of all this carbon dioxide. About half of all the carbon dioxide that's released through human actions at the moment is drawn into the oceans. And we're very that's very fortunate for us that it is. But unfortunately, even the oceans, which you might think of as being kind of just too big to mess with, are beginning to really feel the impacts. So have a look at this. This is a 25 million year uh, reconstruction of ocean uh, acid and alkaline levels. And what you'll notice, and I added in a little red line here, just to show you the line below which um, the acidity has never, has never been beyond this point. So have a look at a reconstruction over 25 million years. Yeah, so we're going from left to right. We're now up to 15 million years ago, 10 million years ago, five, up to the present day, and then we're going to go forward 100 years. And again, you see the same pattern, except this time reversed. And this is the impact of vast amounts of carbon dioxide being rapidly taken up by the world's oceans, and in the process, changing the nature of the chemistry of the oceans. Now, it's a hell of a thing, isn't it, for one species to change the chemistry of the world's oceans. It's one thing changing the, the uh, temperature of the atmosphere, which is really quite a small little segment. I mean, think of the atmosphere. It's really only about 10 or 15 miles high. In fact, from here to Galway, it's the, the atmosphere going that way. It's so narrow. If you were to think of the world as a beach ball, and you painted the beach ball with varnish, that's how thin the atmosphere is, extraordinarily thin, and yet all human life exists within that tiny atmospheric tissue. Now, the oceans, on the other hand, are massive. So, when you see these kind of changes penetrating through the oceans, you know that we are now the primary force of nature in the world. So, how are we doing, really? I think that's the, the, the question, so I'll, I'll press on. Now, this is an article that just really confirms what I've just said, and it said the rate of ocean acidification due to carbon emissions is at, currently at its highest for 300 million years. So I only showed you a 25 million year uh, reconstruction. So what we can say is the rate of acidification has never been bettered in 300 million years. That's a long period of time. So what does that mean? From this article, we're entering an unknown territory of marine ecosystem change and exposing organisms to intolerable evolutionary pressure. So, try to translate that into something that we can get our heads around. Sorry, to, to conclude the point of that, the next mass extinction, the marine mass extinction, appears to already have begun. 
Now, this is another article, and this is quite interesting. It relates to the end Permian mass extinction event, which we know happened about 252 million years ago. This is called the Great Dying, and it makes the that whole business with asteroid and dinosaur 65 million years ago seem like a, a speed bump. This is the big one. So, what happened? This mass extinction at the boundary of the Permian-Triassic era, 252 million years ago, was caused by the acidification of the world's oceans as a consequence of an increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide. And no, we didn't cause it. Carbon dioxide went up, it spiked for different reasons at that time. But let's look at the consequences. It was described as the single most catastrophic event in the history of life on Earth. Between 95 and 99% of everything alive on Earth died as a result of this spike, in a, in severe spike in ocean acidification. So that's a lesson from history if ever you saw one. It's not an asteroid, but it's certainly on that scale. So moving back to where we are now, this first slide again shows you uh, the temperature anomaly for, for January 2016. I, rather than doing going through these, I just want to show you some of the, the, the media coverage on this, take you up to February. Uh, we had an extraordinary temperature anomaly in February 2016. We had a spike of surf surface temperatures 1.35 centigrade warmer than average temperatures. Now, John mentioned earlier about the two degree limit. I'm sure you've heard about the two degree limit. Paris said 1.5, in fact, is the danger rail. February, we spiked 1.35. Now, there are some mitigating factors like an El Nino. We don't expect this. This, this is a bit of an outlier. So let's see how do we do in March. March 2016 is the hottest year globally ever recorded since we started keeping global instrumental records in the 1880s. So we've just experienced the hottest year ever. Now, if you go back from March 2016 and go back 11 months, every month has slightly different temperature characteristics, but every month going back the previous 11 months is the hottest month of its kind in recorded history. Now, that's one hell of a sequence. It looks like the, the burners are starting to really kick in. So a lot of the things that people like me and John have been talking about for years, saying, if, you know, we really got to watch this because this thing could start to get away from us. And unfortunately, that we're now beginning to see the, the, the sense of an acceleration in these patterns. Now, I thought this is interesting because maybe this is the most surprising headline of the lot, that economists actually noticed for the first time that um, the biggest disaster threat to the global economy in 2016 is, in fact, climate change. So it's taking its, this, this is the societal shift where it moves away from the scientific papers and where the, the, the eggheads in economics departments and so on start to realize the consequences of this, shall we say, what we've let out of the box in relation to, to climate change. So not everyone agrees. Uh, here's a recent headline. Global warming apparently stopped 16 years ago, and the Met Office said so, so it has to be true. They even have a chart. So I thought, damn, I've been found out. Myself and Sweeney, out of here. Take the bus, back to Galway. So I want to have a look at this, and I, and I want to show you some of my own chart-making skills to see how you think I could do. I looked at the actual data. This is the NASA data for the period of the pause. So if you roll it on, you'll see how the pause is doing. Not much of a pause, so I said, right, you know, what's going on here? Maybe I too could write for that newspaper, but what would I have to do? <laughs> sort it. What pause? Motivated reasoning. Beware of motivated reasoning. It's, there's a lot of it out there. So, John beat me to it here, so I'm going to say nothing about this other than to say that uh, if you wish to mislead people about uh, scientific subject, given the amount of natural variability in the climate system, it's a piece of cake. Now, this is a slide from an insurance company called Munich RA, They're the world's biggest insurance company. They took a baseline of 1980, which is pretty recently. I was, where was I? Yeah, just, I was finished school. It's that, like, it's really just within the lifetime of many people in this room. It's only 35 years. So what they've looked at are a series of items, geophysical events, meteorological, hydrological, climatological. Now, have a look at these numbers, 300 and 350. Okay? So for geophysical events, not so much. Um, hydrological events in a 35-year period globally have increased by 350%. 
8% in frequency. This is as measured by an insurance company. You might ask the question, maybe back in the 1980s they didn't do much global measurement. They did. Lots. Uh, the other one, um, climatological events running just under, between 300 and 350. Now, this is the Earth system responding to all that heat I was talking about earlier, all that energy being pushed into the oven, closing the door up tight, and wondering how will that express itself. And you'll notice, by the way, here, a lot of wavy lines. This is the internal variability within the climate system. So as soon as somebody like me stands up and says, oh, it's going to be a cold this, that, and the other, the weather will make a fool of you, and it'll do the exact opposite, because you have huge variability within the system. But again, what the scientists are looking at isn't the variability, it's the trend lines. And again, a 30 to 35 year period gives you a very clear trend line. So I think it's something certainly to consider. That's the hydrological and the climatological events. And we know exactly how this in Ireland has expressed itself. We've, we've seen all these pictures, and, and John has gone through it in some detail. Now, this was my slide, but I kind of was looking at it the other night, and I thought, hang on a second, that, that, that's not right. In fact, I had to update it. Very sophisticated graphic update there, I hope you like it. Up to a one degree centigrade, and we added in a little red just to show you where that is. Observed warming since the pre-industrial age. We know this is the threshold of danger is the, is the least way we can put it. We also know that two degrees is almost certainly too high to be safe, and based on how we're currently doing our business, too low to be possible. Four degrees, a very bad place indeed. And six degrees, according to the International Energy Agency, is where we're headed. So. This is the absolute upper limit, and this is the route, the trajectory that what's called business as usual, BAU, has set us on this trajectory. And this trajectory is a road to ruin. So, here's a question. We know where we don't want to go. How do we not get there? And the short answer is with difficulty. And I want to just translate this into, into something to get your head around for a second. Here we're tracking the use of fossil fuels and the emissions arising from them, from basically the Industrial Revolution, 1850 up to 2013. It's a marvelous chart because you can actually spot little things like the Great Depression, the oil crises, they make little dips. Even uh, that one there, that was the 2008 crash. So this is a very sensitive instru instrument, and what it tells you is that carbon dioxide and fossil fuel use have been running in lockstep. In how they, they're the building bricks, if you like, and the, and the byproducts of how we've put together this high-energy society that we all uh, live in and many of us enjoy. Now, imagine you had to toss a coin. and one side, we get to avoid exceeding two degrees. The other side, not so lucky. So we're going to toss a coin. Now I want to show you on the right-hand side of this chart the rate at which we're going to have to decarbonize globally in order to achieve a 50% chance of avoiding 2 degrees centigrade. I put this out not to, not to turn people off and depress them, but just to be realistic about the scale of the challenge. This is how quickly we're going to have to come down the carbon mountain. Voluntarily, almost vertically, to be completely globally decarbonized by 2100. So we're going to have to undo the Industrial Revolution even more quickly. Sure. Yeah, um, we have a carbon cycle and carbon balance. Carbon dioxide is, is, of course, a natural gas. Of course it is. Lots of gases are natural. We have an excess of carbon dioxide, and it's the excess that is throwing. Carbon dioxide is a critical trace gas that affects global temperatures. Temperatures and carbon dioxide run together. When you have excessive carbon dioxide in a system, you get heating. 
and what we're looking at here is the heat effect. So the reason we need to get the carbon out of the system is to avoid dangerous heating. The earlier slides, they showed you the effect that we can map very clearly of continuing to push carbon into the system. And by the way, just for the record, where we're actually heading, where all our politicians are telling us is that we're going to take that line and we're going to run it up just about to the roof of the parish hall. But that's what's required now. Uh, we've been here before. <laughs> Shame on you. Anyway, so this is, as you know, what Enda said in September 2014. Um, clocks ticking, future beckoning, doing the right thing, you know, politicians on an away day in New York. And meanwhile, back in Ireland, uh, when, when the various lobbies are breathing down your neck, uh, it's impractical, the targets are wrong, we can't do it, we'll be screwed, etc., etc., etc. This is a tragic chasm between what the science tells us and how our political system interprets that. It's a really tragic chasm. So this is uh, Paris. Um, our spokesperson here says, there's unanimous agreement among world leaders that every country, apart from their own, needs to do much more to save the climate. Sorry, what was that? I didn't see that. So anyway, you may remember we had an election recently. We may be having another one soon, so get used to it. Uh, we did have a leaders' debate uh, with all the leaders present, uh, except the Greens. And I counted up the, the, the hours and the numbers, 22,000 words spoken, not a sentence or a syllable on anything to do with climate or the environment. It simply didn't, didn't, it isn't even on, and this, by the way, is immediately after the Paris conference, where every politician knew that the stakes were high. Yet, when it comes back to the, the, the gritty business of electing politicians, building parties and so on, environment hasn't got a seat at the table in any sense of the word. And that's a shame, because the thing about the environment is, it is where we all live. The environment isn't something over there. It's not a box where hedgehogs live. We live in the environment. We're as much a subset of the environment as any hedgehog. So this is a quick uh, set of overlaid slides uh, just to show you the, the, where, where these messages are getting kind of tangled up. The first one here shows you, it asks the question, are the scientists convinced about the relationship between um, carbon emissions, global warming, and dangerous global warming? And at the moment, we have a consensus of approximately 97% reflected by the little green men here, and 3% in disagreement. So it's one of the strongest international consensus on anything there's ever been. It's stronger than the consensus among physicians about the risks of cigarettes and cancer. That's how strong a consensus this is. Now, how does that translate through the media? 72% of media coverage is sceptical. 28% is broadly in line with what the science says. So 97.3 translates in what we read in our papers and online and so on into 28.72. Now, how does that affect public perception? Seventy-four twenty-six. This is why, as a somebody who works in the media, it disturbs me greatly that the media misrepresentation of climate science has had an enormous and devastating effect on public misunderstanding of this issue. You can see how closely those three charts uh, map, well, particularly the last two charts. And, it's, and it's a, it really is a, it's a tragic misalignment. I call it a communications failure. It's probably the best way I can put it. And it, it reminds me of this slide here where this scientist is sort of presenting his research conclusions, trying to be as clear as possible. And the government and, and uh, media people say, could you kindly re rephrase that in an equivocal, inaccurate, vague, self-serving, and roundabout term that we can all understand? So I did say at the outset that this, this talk, or this discussion for me is about far more than climate change. And I want to try and draw the lens out a little bit wider here. Um, this is Jared Diamond. He, he makes the point species-wide, and he's, he's studied multiple civilization collapses. So this is his special topic. And human civilizations have come and they've gone, uh, one after the other. They rise and fall for all kinds of reasons. But to, it's extraordinary how many previous human civilizations have failed due to the, the, the dramatic failure of their ecological underpinnings. So he makes the point anyway that as a species, 
we really, we've never had it so good. Our spread, our power, the fraction of the Earth's productivity that we command. So from a species point of view, we are, we rock. We're doing great. The bad news is that we're involved in reversing all that progress much more rapidly than we created. Our power threatens our existence. That's a strange statement, isn't it? Our power threatens our existence. So I'm going to want to explore this a little bit further. I'm taking you back in time now to all the way back to 1907. This is probably the last Republican US president I could find anything that I'd be prepared to put into a slideshow about. This is the great conservation president, Theodore Roosevelt. He did like shooting elephants, but we'll, we'll give him that one. He made the point that the conservation of natural resources is the absolute fundamental challenge for the 20th century in the world. So let's see how do we do. World population times four, economy expanded 14-fold, industrial output 40-fold, carbon dioxide emissions 17-fold, sulfur dioxide 13-fold, energy usage 13-fold. Oh, get back, you brute. Et cetera, et cetera. Sorry, a little bit of a jump there. So what you're looking at there is a century of the most intense, concentrated, and escalating human impacts on what is, after all, a finite, closed, limited system. Now, the fun really starts here from 1950 onwards, in a period that is now called the Great Acceleration, just after the Second World War. Now, unprecedented upswing in human impacts and resource usage. Now, this chart is a little bit hard to read, so I'm going to zoom in on it a tiny bit. Okay, so what you'll notice basically is, in pretty much every case, an exponential spike to the right. This is all post-1950. Population, global GDP, global water use, river damming. Direct foreign investment, atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide, ozone depletion, fertilizer consumption. This is how we're feeding all these billions of people. Nitrous oxide concentration, methane concentration, flooding events, surface temperatures in the Northern Hemisphere, fully exploited fishery systems, increase in shrimp farming, domesticated land, the loss of tropical rainforests and woodlands. And the, the charts, they're all the same. They're all exponential charts. Urban population, paper consumption, that's what we're doing with all those forests. And then other indexes of human, of human, shall we say, progress, motor vehicles, telephones. So what that gives you really is, is well, I'll, I'll leave a scientist here to sum it up. He said, it's difficult to overestimate the scale and speed of change. In a single lifetime, humanity has become a planetary scale geological force, a planetary scale force. Yet we have not yet accepted our responsibility. We have the power, but we haven't accepted the responsibility that goes with being the most powerful force on Earth. So what have we done with all that consumption, all those, those, those exponential charts? I quite like this one here, where the, the economist is bemoaning the slight dip in the economy, and he says what we really need to do is to increase our consumption. And sadly, in the West, this is no joke. Economies are maxing out. In America, for example, I... I, I, I I saw um, a clip recently of, of a, a, re a retail specialist talking about the crisis that American families are experiencing, that they just, they're just racking their brains trying to think of what to buy. They have everything. And the stuff they have from last year is in the garage, and the garage is full. They don't know what to buy. It's a crisis. And if they can't restart it, the global growth machine will stall, and then we're screwed. So... This is a mild-mannered uh, geography professor from Georgetown. He put it very well. Uh, he said, the human race, without intending anything of the kind, has undertaken a gigantic, uncontrolled experiment on the Earth. I think it's a very nice way of putting it. And I think the, the key phrase for me there is the lack of intent. We didn't set about it. This isn't some Bond villain that's doing this. This is just billions of humans going about their, their thing, doing their thing. Now, E.O. Wilson, who is the Ant-Man, for those of you who are into such things, he put it very uh, lyrically. He said, an Armageddon is approaching at the beginning of the third millennium. I did check, by the way, that's this one, not the next one. Uh, but it's not the cosmic war and fiery collapse of mankind foretold in scripture. It's the wreckage of the planet by an exuberantly plentiful and ingenious humanity. And I think the cycle of life here, as we evolve out of the ocean, find our way up and...
So, um, this is a, a curious perspective from uh, a chap from the Natural History Museum in, in London, Professor Michael Balter. He's written a book on, on extinction. And he puts it in a, in a curious way. He said, I think humans are a failed species. Our lives are so artificial, they can't possibly be sustained within the limits of the planet. And he makes the point which many people didn't like, didn't appreciate him saying, but he, he's just being, if you like, scientific about it. He said that from purely from a planetary point of view, uh, the planet itself would be delighted for humans to become extinct, and the sooner it happens, the better. Now, again, as somebody working in the media on this, this puzzles me greatly. Here's a clip, and it's from the Irish Independent online. And the reason it's from the Irish Independent online is it didn't make the print edition of the Irish Independent. And it's a headline from uh, September 2014, and it says the world has lost half its animals in the last 40 years. 1970 to 2010, 50% of all the wild species in the world, not the species, the, of the total number of species in the world, gone in 40 years. So here's the source from which it was drawn. Now, I can't actually read that here, but essentially it obviously confirms that the, the information is correct. And I suppose for me, it's kind of puzzling. You know, is that not the biggest story you've ever seen? This is what you're looking at here, is in our lifetime, since I was in primary school, the evisceration of the entire natural world. And if you take it that we've lost 52% of the wild, spe not the species, of the totality of their numbers in 40 years. Anybody who's reasonably good at, at maths can work out how many more decades it will be before we're essentially humans and our domestic animals are all that's left on Earth. Now, here's a little brain teaser. Which do you think weighs more, human beings and our domesticated animals or all the wild vertebrates in the world? The ratio is quite staggering. We outweigh everything in the wild, all the vertebrates in the wild, by a factor of 42, ourselves and our animals. We weigh 425 million tonnes, and what's left in the wild is 10 million tonnes. And this is only going in one direction. We're, we're eating their lunch as a species. And it's, for me, it was summed up very nicely in that. It's a very, you know, stark, but unfortunately that has been... You know, and people often say to me, you know, you know why, why do you go on about it? Humans are doing great. Yes, they are. That's not the point. Our underpinnings are not doing great. And we depend on the natural world and a functioning biosphere the way fish depend on water. We, we are nothing without the natural world. But somewhere along the way, we've forgotten that connection. This is a graphic from the uh, Economist magazine. They did it in their wicked uh, sense of humor. It was their Happy Earth Day cartoon from last year. And they, they created this monster machine called Habitat Destruction. And the warning was, watch out, our most advanced species is, is advancing. So you've got overhunting, war, population, and the exhaust fumes of all this is global warming. That goes back to what I said earlier. Global warming is, and climate change is tremendously important, extremely urgent, but they are a symptom and a side effect of a much wider breach between humans and the rest of the world. Quite nicely put together in that. So we taught up the damage, and one I wanted to focus on, and I know Anya will be doing this in much more detail later, but just to have a quick think for a moment about rainforest clearance. These are, these are finite, um, very, very species-rich areas. And the bit that stuck in my mind is that Rainforests do all kinds of useful things. You know, and it's horrible sometimes to break nature down as only in terms of its human services. But if we want to think about it that way, one of the handiest things that rainforests do is they produce approximately one third of the oxygen in the air in this room. So, rapid destruction of rainforests, how smart is that? What price do you put on breathable air? It's a basic question. And when we in Ireland kind of think, well, you know, Indonesia, Borneo, it's a long way from Ireland. Well, I've never been there. What's it got to do with me? That's the engine that manufactures the air, well, the oxygen in the air that we breathe. And there aren't any replacement engines, by the way. Bill Gates isn't going to develop an oxygen engine to replace this one. Now, my own background, 
uh, I won't go into it in great detail, I've been in medical journalism for the last quarter of a century or so, and that I often think in medical terms about the fix that we find ourselves in. This, as you'll recognise, are bits of us. So I, li I listed a few of the key systems out here. We all have them, at least we should do. And the most important thing about all these, these uh, keystone systems within our own bodies is that no matter how healthy you are, one system here goes down, all other systems go down with it, of your keystone systems, okay? Now, just to translate that, you'll recognize these little guys. These are kidneys. Now, very clever system. We actually have redundancy. Even if you lose a kidney, they're so important that you got, a, you got another one. You'll survive. You'll be fine. Now, if you lose the second kidney, this is your future. Hooked up to one of these, and this is the chemistry that we have to figure out this in order to replace what your kidneys do 24 hours a day without any supervision, without any HSE funding, just all, all they ask of you is to leave them alone and not kill them. And they'll continue to provide all those really useful services. So I often think it's probably a really good idea to let natural systems do what they're supposed to do. Because the idea that we can replace them, and I keep hearing this, economists keep going on, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll cut that down and we'll replace it with that. There's an awful lot of systems that we just can't replace. And when you try to replace even something as simple as a kidney, this is what you end up with. Of course, there's nothing simple about a kidney, but you know what I mean. So, trying to translate this again into, you know, how, how this is expressing itself in, 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 say, in journalistic terms. And here I did a search of the terms global warming and climate change in the Irish Times, and I used that one as it's the newspaper record, if you like, for Ireland. Here's from 2007, 2014. So we experienced approximately a 60% drop in coverage in the national newspaper of record at a time of growing ecological crisis. So understandably, people often say to me, but I thought they kind of fixed that climate thing. You don't hear that much about it anymore. So I say, no, no. Forget about the first part of the sentence. The second part is, you don't hear that much about it anymore. We're still working on the fixing it bit. You just, unfortunately, the reporting on it has gone south. So this is the same chart, except this time for RTE News. And this, remember, is a national broadcaster, freed from the, from the constraints of, of uh, you know, um, billionaire owners or having to chase the advertising dollar. So here's our, our, our journalistic professionals left to their own devices to cover the most critical story that any of them in their lifetime will cover, in my opinion. And this is how it's going. And this, by the way, this, this is um, quantitative only. It doesn't tell you, for example, if half or two-thirds of those stories are, are actually completely wrong. That's a separate matter. So George Bernard Shaw put it quite nicely. He said, newspapers appear to be unable to discriminate between a bicycle accident and the collapse of civilization. He was being ironic. Um, I wanted to bring that quote up to date with one of my favorite ones. The freedom of the press appears to mean the freedom to print such of the proprietor's prejudices as the advertisers don't object to. And this has been a massive problem in the press, particularly the Murdoch media. Um, and the contamination of information by highly motivated billionaire proprietors who are determined not to allow pesky facts to interfere with their commercial and business interests, which happen to include newspapers and other media. So, changing times now. I have a feeling I've been beaten to this slide as well, haven't I? Yes, I have. Oh, have I not? Sorry. Yeah, this is an Irish Times front page editorial, December the 7th, uh, 2009. Unless we com combine to take decisive action, climate change will ravage, if you don't mind, our planet. And the dangers are apparent. Scientific journals, the debate is over. Yet, so far, the world's response has been feeble and half-hearted. Now, it's unfair to pick on single articles, but editorials are different because that is the voice of the newspaper. They're unsigned, so that's what the newspaper thinks. So you kind of say, well, okay, at least the newspaper's on board. Thank goodness we can move on to the next subject. So there was quite a cold snap after that. So this thing appeared on the 6th of January, which is just under three weeks later. So much for all that guff about global warming. Are we having the wrong debate? I'm freezing. So this, to me, underpins the problem, and that is that our understanding in the media of climate change is a mile wide and an inch deep. 
the slightest thing and you blow it over. So even our own perceptions, like cold weather, is sufficient to, to dislodge our, the part of our brain that does the hard bit, the, the really thinking stuff, gets com regularly gets flipped over and replaced by the, the, the anecdotal reasoning. Oh no, it's this, it's that, it's the other. And unfortunately, that's reflecting itself in our newspaper coverage. And the Father Ted fans will be familiar with the difference between small and far away. They're quite different things. So this is a very quick recap. This is the biggest uh, meta-study of peer-reviewed climate articles, 1991 to 2012. Uh, just under 14,000 articles. 24 of them reject global warming hypothesis, just for anybody left in the room who's still wondering about this. Oh, sorry, I had to include the graphic there, sliver. So I make the point here, ignorance isn't bliss. And this is uh, George Marshall. He's a, a, an English communicator who's written some very interesting stuff on how difficult it is for us cognitively to get our heads around climate change. And one of the graphics that, that have been produced around this is, I call it fitting in or speaking out. So let's say that's you. You're the red person in the group. And you're having a chat about climate change down the pub. The jury's still out. You say, no, the jury's not out. It's And you're thinking, hang on. No, I kind of like the pub. I think I'll just stay quiet about it. People get very upset about this stuff, so I, I want to fit in. I don't want to be a troublemaker. I don't want to be a killjoy. Here's another problem we have. This one is called the games our brains play. Hmm, later, not so bad. Somebody else, maybe it's a hoax. And of course, the longer we all together delay and deny, the more reassuring it is. The more we feel, well, if it was really that bad, we'd all be doing stuff. So optimism is a very natural, positive human trait. And I'm a big fan of optimism, but it has its limits. And in this particular case, what we find is that 65% of interviewees believe that climate change will harm future generations, but only 38% believe it will harm them personally. So we have this constant offshoring of risk and kicking into the middle distance, because that also conveniently pushes the responsibility to deal with this onto somebody else's shoulders. It's a curious thing because mostly we're very careful about the next generation. I'm sure there's many people in this room who've made provision for their kids with you know, getting them through college and so on and so forth. We take great care for the part of the future that is real to us, in other words, where our kids live. However, when it comes to the larger pictures, we, all that care and caution seems to go out the window which is, is very unfortunate. I, I, I call this slide the liar's punishment. And you can, you can try this one at home. Just type in the phrase climate change is into Google, the world's biggest search engine. And here's the first four results, three of which are simply wrong. Now that's, I call that the liar's punishment. And it isn't that you're not believed, but you can't believe anyone else. So Compare and contrast. Here's uh, Bloomberg Business Week, which happens to be owned by Mike Bloomberg, former mayor of New York, billionaire, and uh, strangely enough for a billionaire, actually accepts the science of climate change. So this is how he reacted to Hurricane Sandy. And then on the other hand, uh, this is how the Spectator magazine, within a week or two of that, here's how everything is fine and uh, green taxes hurt the poor, according to um, Bjorn Lomborg. And as John showed so eloquently earlier, um, what really hurts the poor is climate change. Green taxes are the least problems that the poor have to contend with. Now, this is interesting. Uh, well, it is to me anyway. This is a um, distribution of professional opinion on anthropogenic climate change. So if you want to look at the spectrum here, this would be the number of proponents this way and predicted impact, running from slight benefit, neutral, slight cost, substantial cost, all the way to catastrophe. So what we find is the debate in the popular press lives here, somewhere between neutral, which is the right-wing th think tanks, in other words, climate change might be good, might be bad, who knows. And what they've managed to do is they've dragged the whole discussion, all the stuff you hear about in the media, happens in here. And it's only here, the, this section here which I've labeled, this is the popular press, and this area out here is considered unreasonable. So by and large, it's not reported because sensible people like media editors and producers say, ah, no, that's... Yeah. Unfortunately, this is the area 
where most informed opinion resides, like all the IPCC reports. And what they're telling us is that a professional opinion on, on man-made climate change is that unaddressed, we're talking substantial costs, it's on a curve between substantial costs and catastrophe. Yet, what we've managed to do in the press, and I include a little button here to include, say, RT's prime time, is we've managed to corral the debate over here into the, hmm, let's focus on the costs of doing something about climate change, and let's ignore the catastrophic consequences of not doing something about climate change. Trying to put this into, into language, I think some of, the prob some of the difficulty here is that, that the public's understanding of terms uh, versus the scientific understanding, positive trends, theories, manipulation, these are all normal language used in scientific uh, discussion, bias, uh, which to take that as an example, we would understand it to mean distortion or something political. In scientific terminology, that's simply offset from an observation. You can imagine the scope for chicanery here by well-motivated people who use the language of science against it to present scientists in the media as a caricature, as greedy, venial, uh, and somehow or other engaged in some massive global conspiracy for some unknown reason. And communication and the abuse of communication is a huge part of that. This is really interesting from a journalistic point of view because scientists uh, love when you're explaining something to start with the background, then supply the supporting details and eventually get to the results and conclusions. That's the right way to do it. That's not how the public, and it's certainly not how the media work. We are told, don't bore us, get to the chorus. What's it about? Who cares? Oh yeah, and if any room, stick in the supporting details. These two models are profoundly mismatched for how scientists and the scientific community communicate and how we, through the media, absorb. So it partly explains the mismatch. Remember that chart earlier, the 97.3 versus 27 or 27.73? A lot of it is to do, I mean, there is malice, there's no question about it, but a lot of it also is misalignment. So, Steven Pinker, who I'm sure many of you have read, uh, he put it very well. He said, the acquisition of knowledge, it's hard. Our minds are prone to illusions, fallacies, and superstitions. And that was also put very nicely by um, Mark Twain. He said, it isn't what you don't know that causes you the problems. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Now, this is a short, are we, am I okay for time? Am I, am I ruining people's lunch? You are running a bit close there. We won't have. Okay. Well, I'm not going to play this then. This is uh, this is a, a few minute clip. I'll, if anybody would like to scare the bejesus out of themselves, you can have a look at it some other time. I'll skip ahead of this one. Um, okay. And I'm going to, that's another video clip. I'm going to skip through that. Oh, I'm going to skip through that as well. There is one rule, cardinal rule, that says never keep an audience, never stand between an audience and their lunch. So I'm going to try and stick to that rule. I'm going to wrap up really quickly by talking briefly about the difference between problems and predicaments. The older members of our audience will recognize that some mothers do have them. And here's uh, our friend Frank in another pickle. This is a problem. Problems have solutions. This is a predicament. Predicaments have outcomes. And when we think about climate change, we need to ask ourselves, are we, are we looking at a problem or are we looking at a predicament? Because how we handle the two is a big difference. When you're faced with a predicament, looking for a solution isn't just useless, it can be the wrong thing to do because you divert time and resources trying to manage the outcome rather than, that you should be trying to manage the outcome rather than trying to do the impossible. And by failing to appreciate the nature of our collective predicament, we place ourselves at greater risk because the longer we dither, the less time and the fewer options remain. Now, um, this is my little nautical sequence. I think I will finish up with this one actually. This I'd suggest is where we think we are, certainly we in the West, and, oops, Here's where we may be. Now, even in this situation, there are different positions. You've got the guys up here who are saying, look at the view. It's pretty good, actually. We've never had it so good. You've got the guys in the life raft who are saying, well, it's pretty cold, but could be worse. I could be this guy here. And the difference when it comes to predicament management is about accepting that you're in a predicament and then working on managing the outcome. And the outcome, essentially, in this situation is choosing which position you want to end up to, 
end up in. And just to update that one, if we'd had uh, mobile smart cameras, we thought it would make a hell of a picture. So, pessimism and optimism. Climate disruption, it compels us to abandon most of the comfortable beliefs that have sustained our sense of the world as a stable place. And when we recognize that, our dreams of the future, the natural human response can be to despair, which isn't, of course, a very helpful response. And hopefulness in this context can be another form of denial. And Clive Hamilton, who's an ethicist, he said, we need to allow ourselves to enter a phase of desolation and hopelessness. In short, to grieve, to grieve for the loss of the future that we thought we had and the world that's no longer possible. But of course, we should never allow that to completely cripple us. So I'm going to finish up with the three stages of grief. Despair, accept, and my favorite, act. And now I hope we have a short video. No, we don't. It's supposed to put itself to sleep. Anyway, I'll, I'll narrate it, a silent narration. This is a man, a doctor, explaining to a woman, he said to her, um, can I be frank with you? And she says, no. So he goes on to say, oh, you'll be fine. And off she walks, happy as a lark, right? And he's there going, if that's what you want to believe. And that's the situation, to some extent, that we find ourselves in. The news isn't good. But the thing is, even after a bad diagnosis, the question isn't the diagnosis. The question is, what do we do next? Thank you very much. Cheers. Um, can I just ask if, we, if there's anyone who has a really urgent question that they must ask, um, they could do so. But I think most of us are hungry and looking forward to a nice break now. So is that, is that an urgent one? Last time Primetime covered this subject, uh, which was in December, just before the, the, the climate conference, they brought on uh, a scientist who essentially said everything is pretty much fine uh, and agriculture is too important to do anything and things are fine. And uh, I know a whole group of people, they got over 20 written complaints about that, which are currently being adjudicated on by the BAI. But what to me is so heartbreaking is, you know, like uh, they, they, they just simply, even Primetime won't accept the scientific consensus. Mm. That there was nothing mentioned about the environment. No. And nobody, all of us here present, where our voices were, but yeah. there didn't seem to be anybody challenging that. Yeah. The problem is that it's, you know, there are vested interests and people looking after their own backyard. Understandably, they're very focused and they're very together. Whereas this is, the concerns of people in this room are very dissolute. We're all worried about different things. But collectively, what we're concerned about is overwhelming. But individually, it seems, you know, you're worried about this, I'm worried about that, John's worried about something else. But that's what I'm trying to pull it together, that we, we're in a collective pickle, but it's very difficult to, to, to energize our politicians about that. Thank you. Can I, can I just leave it? Will you be very long? Will it be a quick one? John, quick reaction to that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm completely on your, on your page about this. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, for example, have a look at, look up the list of the National Climate Advisory Council. It is full of economists. It is chaired by an economist who was on the radio recently saying, hmm, climate change is something that might affect my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. He's not even au fait with today's science. Well, there again is where you have to challenge it because science is not our it's not a science, no. no. It's a social science. Yeah. 
Okay, we'll, we'll draw it to a close, I think. I'd like to thank John Gibbons very much and John Sweeney from this morning. I'm going to take two positives from this morning, one from each speaker. One is that John Sweeney pointed out that it is affordable and we can afford to do it. It's the economic cost of saving the planet is actually affordable. And I'm going to take a positive from John um, Gibbons that um, we're all in this room, we've just heard what's been said, and if we can go out and spread the word instead of saying, OK, I don't want to cause trouble in the pub, then that's one positive anyway. So we're going to make the lunch hour a little bit later because we're running late, so if we could all be back here for quarter to two, please, instead of um, 1.30. Um, so we've got some more positive speakers coming up um, to build on for the future. OK, <laughs> thanks now. Bye.